Welcome back to Coriam, the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue Emergency Medicine Residency Program. I'm Bree C here with Joe Offenbacher. Hey Bree. Wow, I can't believe the summer's already over. Yeah, it's a beautiful fall day here in New York City. Given how crazy the past year plus has been with new disease entities, remember Valley, and, you know, the pandemic, I think it's time we talked about a true bread and butter topic today. What you got? Just good old pneumothorax. Yeah, that's a great topic. To be fair, we could talk about pneumos for hours, given it's actually a pretty robust topic, but let's just start with a quick overview for the emergency department. Deal. Okay, Joe, so what exactly is a pneumothorax? Quite simply, a pneumothorax is defined as a disease process in which gas accumulates in the intrapleural space. Right. And the etiology of the gas that occupies this otherwise negative potential space has a major impact on how we classify and manage the disease. Exactly. Three major mechanisms are described, including spontaneous pneumothorax, which develops without any external factors, but think possible underlying risk factors, iatrogenic pneumothorax, which is secondary to a medical procedure, And finally, traumatic pneumothorax, which is pretty much what it sounds like. And don't forget, there are several other miscellaneous causes as well, which include anorexia, exercise, drug use, immunosuppression, and barotrauma from either air travel or scuba diving. Nice. And spontaneous pneumothorax can also be further subclassified as well. Exactly. It can be defined as either primary or secondary. Primary spontaneous pneumothoraces develop in patients with no clear underlying lung disease. Think of the typically young, tall smoker who bent over and developed acute onset of symptoms. While often there's no pre-known lung disease in these patients, sometimes underlying ruptured blebs are to blame. In contrast, secondary pneumothoraces are secondary to underlying existing lung disease. That makes sense. These patients are usually older and often suffer from lung disease such as COPD, cystic fibrosis, lung cancer, active infection, or cystic lung disease. In some cases, systemic structural diseases, such as Marfan syndrome or Eichler-Zdanilo, may play a role. Hold on, Bray. A primary spontaneous pneumothorax is often caused by blebs in those young, tall patients. How do we know that these patients who we defined as primary aren't actually secondary? Fair question, Joe. Sometimes it is hard to tell, and there are those who argue that these distinctions may be somewhat arbitrary. However, most agree that recognizing the disease etiologies as a spectrum might be helpful as some underlying causes are more amenable to treatment than others. Honestly, though, in the ED, it's probably more important to be able to recognize a pneumo urgently and manage it efficiently rather than solve the underlying etiology. Good point. Ultimately, a pneumothorax can have a wide range of causes, clinical presentations, degrees of acuity, and choices for acute management. That's right. And by understanding these factors, we can best understand how to take care of our patients in the ED. Great. So now that we talked about their underlying pathophysiology, how do pneumothoraces typically present? Well, they can come in with acute onset chest pain ipsilateral to the affected lung. The pain is often pleuritic and associated with acute onset of dyspnea. Keep in mind, though, that the severity of symptoms can range from virtually asymptomatic just to some mild discomfort all the way to severe pain with respiratory distress. That's right. It's also important to remember that the historical presentation of a pneumothorax can mimic several other cardiopulmonary disease processes. Exactly. And this is why a good physical exam is helpful when assessing these patients. How so? Well, as with so many cardiopulmonary disease processes, patients may present with nonspecific findings such as tachycardia and tachypnea. But patients with large enough pneumos may also demonstrate diminished breath sounds and auscultation. You may also notice diminished fremitus or hyperresonance to percussion. In rare cases, patients may also develop some cutaneous emphysema. And in all honesty, though, Joe, I'm not sure the last time I percussed for hyperresonance or asked a patient to hum while I felt their chest. I think that was in med school. But cool findings, though. True, true. Basically, if you have a high clinical suspicion for pneumothorax from the story and exam, then it's also important to consider symptoms suggesting the presence of tension pneumothorax, including hypotension and tracheal deviation. Good point. So while we're on the subject of tension pneumos, maybe we can just take a second to better describe what it is. Definitely. 
So a tension pneumothorax is the presence of intrapleural air that is under positive pressure throughout the entire respiratory cycle. Continuous and increasing positive pressure within the intrathoracic space can lead to diminished venous return, preload, and ultimately extravascular obstructive cardiovascular shock. Wow, super scary stuff. But remember that a tension pneumo is a clinical diagnosis. Treatment, as we'll soon discuss, should not be delayed for a confirmatory testing. So in terms of testing, this is probably a good time to discuss the tests that are helpful in the diagnosis of a pneumothorax. Okay. So starting with labs will not be especially helpful other than possibly ruling out other etiologies of the patient's presenting symptoms. Labs could be helpful in better characterizing the underlying conditions that may have led to the development of secondary pneumos, but they're generally not the first thing that we think of. Very true. Even findings of lab tests like an ABG are not specific in diagnosis. EKG findings are also nonspecific and can range from bradycardic rhythms, especially in patients who develop hypoxia, to sinus tachycardia. So I feel like we should go to imaging. So ultimately, a non-tension pneumothorax is a radiographic diagnosis. Imaging modality is to consider including chest x-ray, CT scan, and of course, pocus lung ultrasonography. Ultrasound is often the best point of care test for patients in the ED. It's fast, easy, reliable, and you could do it at the bedside. Exactly, which is super key, especially for unstable patients. But do remember that an unstable patient, secondary to a suspected tension pneumo, should not have emergent intervention delayed for any form of diagnostic imaging. Yep, confirming suspected tension pneumothorax is no good if the patient already coded. For stable patients, initial assessment is generally done via an upright plain film chest x-ray before or after a bedside ultrasound. Due to x-rays relatively low sensitivity, equivocal findings should be followed by CT imaging, which has much higher sensitivity. CT imaging should also be considered to look for underlying etiologies of suspected secondary pneumothoraces. So regarding the statistical utility of imaging modalities, ultrasound is highly user dependent, but it's thought to have a sensitivity of 86 to 98% as compared to an AP chest x-ray, where sensitivities range from 28 to 75%. It's quite a range. CT is considered the gold standard. I usually start off with an ultrasound, then get an AP chest x-ray if I don't have to intervene immediately. Ditto. On long ultrasound, remember, waves on a beach are normal, while the barcode sign is bad. We really want to see that lung sliding. Check out our Coriam pulmonary ultrasound post link in the show notes for images and more good stuff. Okay, great. So as we move along to ED management of a pneumothorax, the name of the game is clinical acuity and the size of the pneumothorax. Let's take a look at these options in a descending order of acuity, starting with attention pneumothorax. Definitely. Worse first. So, as we discussed, Patients with suspected tension pneumos should prompt immediate decompression. This is often done via needle thoracostomy with a large bore, like a 14 gauge needle, into the second intercostal space midclavicular line, just above the third rib. You know, some advocate for using other anatomic locations, but this is generally the accepted location for emergent needling. Agreed. It is also important to mention that there are those who advocate for finger thoracostomies for primary decompression. But as you mentioned before, needle thoracostomy remains the standard of care and first step in clinical management. Right. And also remember, a needle thoracostomy is not a definitive form of management. It must then be followed up by chest tube or pigtail placement. The order of interventions matters a lot in patients with pneumothorax as well. We might be tempted to go straight to intubation in really sick hypoxic tachypneic patients come into the door but always consider a tension pneumothorax on a differential before jumping to intubation. If you intubate a tension pneumothorax before fixing it, the positive pressure will cause cardiovascular collapse. For a pneumothorax not causing tension physiology, manage depend management depends on a range of factors, including the severity of symptoms, size and cause of the pneumothorax. Additional considerations include whether this is the first or second pneumothorax. Exactly. I mean, I think in patients with secondary pneumothorax or a primary pneumo larger than 2 centimeters, or just any patient with significant symptoms, placement of a chest tube or a pigtail catheter is usually indicated. But, I mean, don't all pneumos just get procedural interventions, Joe? Actually, a landmark study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020 showed modest evidence that conservative management of primary spontaneous pneumothorax 
that is 100% oxygen with monitoring and repeat chest x-ray, was non-inferior to interventional management with a lower risk of serious side effects. Hmm. I mean, we've always thought pneumothorax equals chest tube. So were these all teeny tiny pneumos in the study, Joe? Actually, no. Patients were included if they were 14 to 50 years old with a unilateral primary spontaneous pneumothorax of 32% or more on chest x-ray. Check out our show notes for an image showing how size was calculated. Wow, that's actually a decently sized pneumo. So what are you doing in your practice, Joe? Do all your patients get a trial of oxygen and observation? Definitely not. First of all, many EM docs still only consider not intervening on healthy patients with small, defined as less than 2 centimeter, first-time non-tension simple pneumothoraces. Which is a very small subset of patients. That means you definitely decompress for any patient with mechanical ventilation, secondary spontaneous pneumos, bilateral pneumos, obviously unstable patients, recurrent pneumo, tension pneumo, or traumatic pneumo. Only very carefully selected patients should prompt non-intervention. Also, check in with your own institution's guidelines and practices for both acute management and dispo. Right. Across different institutions, Patients with pigtails or chest tubes may ultimately end up on medicine, palm, thoracic surgery, or the trauma service, depending on hospital resources and guidelines. And don't forget that post-pigtail or chest tube chest x-ray. Right, you definitely want to confirm in real time. Okay, ready to do some take-home points. Sure. I'll start us off. One, pneumothorax can be grouped into spontaneous, which can be primary or secondary, iatrogenic or traumatic. Two, urgent diagnosis is important, so listen for breath sounds, beware of tachypnea and tachycardia, and bedside ultrasound is awesome. You can always follow with a chest x-ray and CT PRN to confirm. Three, treatment includes needle thoracostomy, pigtail, and chest tube. Oxygen, observation, and monitoring with a repeat chest x-ray is for a select few. And finally, remember to also treat the pneumothorax before positive pressure ventilation because that's a quick way to kill your patient. Touche. Well, that's all for this episode. Continue to follow us on Twitter at core underscore EM and visit us on our website, coreem.net. Thanks for listening and be well, everybody.